Welcome to Amen Practice, where we talk about life as a practitioner, wellness in general, and of course, what it means to practice. I'm your host, Jess Reynolds, and today we dive into a harsh fact. We live in a world where physical and mental well-being, by and large, are seen as separate entities. Now, in our little pocket of wellness, this trend is indeed changing, thankfully, but by and large, that still seems to be the general idea. So my guest today tries to bridge the gap with a unique blend of therapy and mindfulness. And I'm joined by Chad. He's a dedicated massage therapist and a yoga instructor who brings a pretty fresh perspective to holistic health. In our discussion, Chad delves deep into the connection between the physical work we do and mental health, highlighting how integrated approaches can lead to comprehensive wellness. We also talk about the importance of playing to one's strengths. And this reveals how when we focus on our strengths, we can transform both personally and professionally. And of course, for those of you who are more therapeutically inclined, Chad shares his insights to the critical importance of precise assessment in massage therapy and his journey from a practitioner to an educator. So before we jump into today's episode, I'd like to introduce our sponsor, Jane, a clinic management software and EMR with a human touch. Whether you're switching your software or going paperless for the first time, the Jane team knows that the onboarding process, well, it can feel a little bit overwhelming. That's why with Jane, you don't just get a software, you really do get a whole team, including an every Jane subscription is their award-winning customer support. Now, a lot of places will say award-winning customer support, but they really are amazing. And they're available by phone, email, and chat whenever you need, even Saturdays. You can also book a free account setup consultation to review your account and ensure you feel super confident about going live. And if you'd like some extra advice along the way, you can tap into the lovely community of practitioners, clinic owners, and front desk staff through Jane's community Facebook group. It's a solid group. So if you're interested in making the switch to Jane, head to jane.app slash switch to book a one-on-one -on -one demo with a member of their support team. And if you choose to make the switch, don't forget to mention my code, which is aim one m o that's a i m the number one m o at the time of sign up for a one month grace period on your new jane account well chad thank you very kindly for taking the time to chat with me today as always i'm looking forward to our conversation so let's uh let's just jump in the same way i always do and that's just uh talking well talking about you uh we you and i we we've spoken before uh, so, you know, I know a little bit about your history, but I'd like to kind of dig into the nuts and bolts of it, right? So I do know that you're a massage therapist, you're a yoga instructor, you're an instructor of massage as well, right? You probably had your fingers in a bunch of other things here and there, I'm sure. Yep. So I'm curious, uh, just tell me a little bit about your story. What got you into this uh, pretty amazing world of of manual medicine? Yeah, good question. Thanks, Jess. Um, I've, I've told this story a few times, um, in various different settings and everything. Um, but it's, I feel like it's a pretty good story and it just gives you my backstory of essentially how I became a massage therapist. Um, and it was mainly because of long distance running. So in high school, I became a cross country runner. So running anywhere from distances to starting then in grade nine, 4k, 3k, all the way up to five. And then as I excelled. I moved into 10 kilometer cross country races. Um, but as high school moved on, I, I became more and more competitive. And as I became more and more competitive, um, injuries happened, muscle aches and pains. And my coach who, um, he passed away a few years ago, but he was a phenomenal coach considered to be one of the best high school cross country running coaches in Canada. Um, but he told me to go and get a massage when I had a, an Achilles injury. Mm -hmm. This was before I knew how the Achilles was attached to the calf. And it was just mild Achilles tendonitis. But when you're in the ninth or 10th grade, you're like, what's wrong with my calf? So I went and got a massage and I realized like, hey, this, this worked, this helps. I can go back to my training. And then I had some various other injuries, like a small back sprain when I was doing a relay. Mm -hmm. um, don't ask distance runners to run four by 100 meter relays. That's uh, <laughs> not, not great for distance runners. 
Um, but I, I injured my back, just a mild sprain. I went and got a back massage, same massage therapist. And I started thinking, I was like, hmm, this is, this is kind of a cool pr profession. Hmm. And my massage therapist was actually named Chad as well. So that was kind of unique. And cool. over that four year period as, as a um, dedicated and, and well-disciplined distance runner, um, I went to see him for maintenance massages, little injuries, but I probably got at least anywhere from four to eight massages a year uh -huh. um, using my parents' benefits package. And that's when it started to kind of click in as like, hey, this is a cool skill. Uh, my massage therapist works out of his house. It's a versatile profession. And that's when I decided to think, like, or I started to think like, hey, this, this would be good. I think I'd like this. So it was probably the 10th or 11th grade when I was like, I want to learn massage. Fast forward a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty young. Um, and fast forward a couple of years, I traveled, tried a few other things, went to university, still continued running. And then I decided like, hey, you know what? I think it's time to go to school for something. Uh, and see if I really enjoy this. And I finally went to school for massage when I was, I think, around the age of 22. So it was 2007. Uh -huh. uh, and I went to Western College, Western College of Massage in Regina, Saskatchewan. And I just fell in love with it right away. I uh -huh. found the school, the teachers, the amount of learning, the anatomy and physiology. Um, I loved learning about the human body. Although it felt overwhelming at times, I was like, oh, this is how the lungs work. This is how the heart works. This is actually how my muscles work. Mm -hmm. Just to have that all click, you just really become a health professional. And then suddenly you apply it to everything in life. Um, yeah. So that's, that's how I became an RMT. Thank you. I really, really appreciate your story. And you know, what, what came up for me as I was hearing, uh, particularly near the end, is you described the anatomy and physiology. And that's one of the things that I personally loved most when I was teaching in the classroom and why I think massage is such an amazing field because it is, it's, it's a legitimate health profession, right? But let's, let's be honest. What, what are the entry requirements? They don't exist. Anybody yeah. can become a massage therapist. And for so many people, right, they walk into that AMP class and they're like, oh my God, I, I'm ready yeah. to tap out. But because it's, you know, fairly, fairly basic stuff, it doesn't take too terribly long before most people get a little bit of a handle. And how many people's eyes open when they, they learn anatomy and physiology for the first time? Having come into it, maybe maybe they dropped out of school in grade 10. Maybe they never thought they would go to college or university. But the accessibility to this medical profession and how it, it really does empower people with this knowledge of the body, it's so cool. And, and hearing that maybe you had a similar experience, you know, going into AMP, going into massage and being like, wow, this is, this is how it works. You know, this is how my body works. This is how other people's bodies work. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very empowering. Uh, I think most people agree that it's empowering. And students will often get in and they're like, this is hard. They're like, this is like nursing kind of school. This is like what mm. doctors learn. And I always tell my students, well, you are health professionals. You should be able to communicate. And if you're putting your hands on a body, you should know how it works, right? We don't, mm -hmm. we, we learn the skin, we learn the muscles, but how does the blood flow? How does the nervous system work? So once you tie it all together, you're like, ah, oh, I get it. Yeah. And I, I like to go at a pace that is um, good for all my students. And I was lucky to go to a school that was a pretty, um, I wouldn't say it was a slow pace, but it wasn't quite like university where the instructor or the professor says, okay, this is the slides. This is what you got to learn. And then you go and study, at mm -hmm. least in um, massage therapies, colleges and universities. I find that the pace can be like, hey, do you have a question about the kidneys? Like, let's take a moment. Let's go over it. Let's watch a video. And yeah. it's a little bit slower so that you can absorb it and take uh -huh. the time to learn it. So it's not that overwhelming, even though yeah. it's a lot of stuff at first. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And it's so much more applied too. I mean, I can only speak from my own experiences, having, having gone through the schooling I have and having taught what I have, but I find that that in the massage world, in the acupuncture world, in the yoga world too, I mean, I've taught a lot of uh, yoga anatomy workshops, is it's essentially just Q&As and applied anatomy more than anything else. Sure, it's super cool to learn about how the mitochondria work and how 
molecules or atoms make molecules and molecules, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the, the application and how, how most of these programs are set up in such a way to follow these curiosities, I think is pretty cool. Now, do you teach anatomy or what do you teach? Oh, great question. Yeah, I teach a, yeah. honestly a little bit of everything at the, at the college that I teach at. Um, I've been teaching for five years now, almost six, I okay. feel. Uh, and initially it started kind of slow, just like one class a week. I was commuting actually from Canmore um, to Calgary on mm -hmm. Mondays. And I just, this is kind of leading into another story of how I became a teacher. Um, but yeah. I, I got this part-time job just teaching therapeutic exercise, which I was pretty familiar with being an athlete and a personal trainer history and then a yoga teacher. So I had a, a good understanding of stretching, strengthening, um, muscle contraction, core, core strengthening, things like that. But anyways, I, I moved to um, Calgary because I just was feeling like, you know what, I want to teach more. And there's no school in Canmore, at least not yet. Um, so I moved to the city and felt like I needed a change. And I, I dove into teaching um, like about 20 hours a week and actually did go up a little bit more to 25 ish. Uh, and then I became the program coordinator at a school. So I got to be in charge of the curriculum and just making sure the students are learning what they need to learn to mm -hmm. become a, a great RMT. Uh, and then I transferred over to another school. So in that current role, um, I teach pretty much every single course. So there's, well, I couldn't tell you how many, there's close to like 48 different courses. And some mm -hmm. of them are continuing on like path one, path two, yeah. path three. So I teach nearly every subject now. Um, but I like to say nice. that I specialize in more of the hands-on, the assessment, the anatomy. Mm -hmm. I like anatomy. And then some of the physiology classes I'm better at, like pretty good at the heart, um, decent with the nervous system, uh, brain. I'm not an expert with the brain structure, um, but I always say uh, that's a part where the massage therapist can kind of dive in as much as they want, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. You know, it sounds... I'm I'm shocked at the similarities between our educational and our rather instructing um, backgrounds. I mean, parallels very similarly. My my journey is almost identical. Kind of got into it and followed a similar thing. And at the end of it, same thing. It was more that the hands-on, huge into the assessment world, right? And I'm curious. I mean, there's there's a few different directions I want to go in, but but one maybe sort of side path, just a little curiosity, is um. I talk to a lot of massage therapists who want to become an instructor. Uh, would you have any advice or anything to say to anybody who's a massage therapist who's like, I really want to teach this? Uh, what would you say? Uh, any thoughts, any advice? Ooh, so I can go a couple different routes. And I've actually done some free um, like Zoom Q&A, uh, just one so far. I'd like to do another one where a couple of people just came to ask me questions about my journey to become a, a massage instructor. Um, first thing, I think it's a great idea. Like if you haven't tried it, um, definitely become a massage instructor if you want to. And you may mm. not like it. That's okay. Um, you can try it. But if you feel like you want to teach, there's probably something that you that you feel you want to share, right? Um, I highly recommend that. I mean, the, the minimum is having three years of experience as a, mm -hmm. as a practitioner. Um, so coming back to your question about like what I would say is one route is like the teaching route. So what I learned pretty early on, early on was trying to create, or as an instructor, you should try to create an environment for learning. So what that means is that you don't have to spend all the time talking. You don't have to t spend all the time kind of projecting information, mm -hmm. but you want to create an opportunity for learning to occur especially in the classroom. Online, when we teach in those hybrid settings where you're just lecturing, you want to get the students to talk a little bit here and there. But when you're in the classroom, you want to get the students together and say, kind of give them an exercise and just kind of like let them explore. So mm -hmm. let, them, let them palpate the body. And then they're like, hey, Chad, what's this? And I was like, oh, you're on the AIIS or you're on the PSIS. Or like, yeah, that what muscle do you think is attached to the superior iliac crest and they'll be like oh i feel this and that's when learning occurs totally so, yeah 
learning occurs when there's a self-realization of knowledge. It's not about like projecting your information. And one of my favorite quotes is, I can't remember who said it. I think it was actually a, um, a very like famous yoga teacher. I think it might've been his son. So there's Krishna Macharya. I can't remember who they were, but I think it might've been Iyengar's son. And um, he said, what the teacher teaches and what the student learns are two completely different things. And I really like that. I think, I think that's mm-hmm. important to recognize. Yeah. That's great. That's really amazing advice. And I could, I, I agree completely. Uh, teaching is, is surprisingly easy. I mean, my, my opinion is you, you need to know a minimum three times as much as what you intend on teaching. So if you're going to teach origins, insertions of five muscles, you need to know origin insertions of like 15. Sure. So there's like the baseline knowledge, but above and beyond that, I think in these, the, like in the massage world in particular, any of these manual medicine worlds, it's just like do get your hands on some people and, and palpate. And that, that's actually an interesting thing that you, you brought up palpation because I do know that you, you do quite a bit of assessment as well, right? And, mm-hmm. and I'm curious how, how palpation, how using palpation fits into your assessment protocol or, um, you know, a lot of times assessment, I'm not sure if it's the same with you, but when, when I was teaching assessment, it's, you know, like let's, let's learn our active, our passive, our resisted, our special tests. But for me, I find like I get into the actual clinic and I don't follow the protocol that I taught for years, you know, do this, do this, do this, and then do this. Yeah. But I get into the treatment room and it's like a little bit of palpation. It's a little bit of this. It's a little bit of that. Right? Yeah. So kind of what's your, what's your style? What are your thoughts on the assessment protocol for massage therapists? Yeah. So um, I think I've, I've mentioned before, um, I came out with a range of motion assessment course earlier this year, which is accessible online through a, another company. Um, Mm -hmm. which I'm really proud of is my first course, um, lots of learning and creating that. And I created it because I found that a lot of graduates, like new graduates and some of the RMTs forgot how to put together simple ROM assessments. Mm -hmm. And, And I was like, you know, there's a really easy way to utilize this. And I think a lot of times we're taught it from some older textbooks where we're like, okay, there's active range of motion, passive, resisted, but we don't always look at like why we use the active, why we use the passive and why we use the resisted. And the resisted Mm -hmm. is easy because what we're really doing is we're just measuring strength, right? So we're checking like, does this muscle work? And it may not work because there's some neurological problem or maybe there's an injury or maybe it's just a little bit weak and it's like, hey, just start to do some basic strengthening exercises you could pick up a can of soup go to the side or get some therabands and then your pain will go away um so massage therapists can't make someone stronger right we can't improve strength you got to do something you need to Mm -hmm. do concentric and eccentric contractions right so that kind of gives you the reason for the resisted rom um i always start with active rom because that gives me a baseline of that person's um ability to move so for example can you do neck um, lateral flexion and they're like yep that feels good how about to the other side they're like oh that kind of pulls and boom i've got information and i'm like you know what if that if there's tension there and pain that's where i'm going to go in my treatment so i like to use palpation last after Mm -hmm. so i use active and then when i get that person on the table i'll grab their head and i'll passively stretch and i'll see oh yeah there is some tension there there is a tissue stretch with that end feel and i don't stress about the bony end feels and the empty end feels and all the other descriptions i'm just looking for how does it feel in my hands and how does Mm -hmm. it compare to the other side right and it's just a tissue stretch 90 percent of the time i'm just doing a tissue stretch to figure out where the tension is and then i palpate And then when I palpate, I'm like, oh, so the active range of motion was limited, the passive was limited, and my palpation confirms my findings. And that's how I like to use palpation. So essentially, it's it's like a confirmation um, assessment, I guess you could Mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I like that. I like that idea. You know, I I found... um... Not too long ago, just like earlier this week, I, I went to to a chiro and it was my first chiro appointment in years and years and years. But I got this hip problem, Chad, I'm telling you, 
it's just like, I've never had pain like this. Like it has taken me, me to my knees and I can't figure it out. Like I'm, mm. I'm pretty good at assessment, you know, I'm not yep. bad at it, I, but I can't figure it out no matter what I do. And like, I'm not, I'm not going to give you the case study right now, but believe you me, I went through the range of motion assessment, all the special tests and I'm drawing a blank. Like I can't figure this out. So I go to this Cairo and and I got his name from from a couple of people I trust. And interestingly enough, I got it from a few different people independently. So I'm like, okay, this guy must be primo. I got to tell you, yeah. this guy is primo. He's in Calgary. Justin Tan is his name and he's fantastic. But I was watching this guy do this this assessment. Of course, I'm not just watching, I'm participating. And and what was so cool is, is he was doing all the same things you just described, active, passive, resisted, but there was no order. There was there was no like doing step one, step two, step three. It was just following this intuition because his mm. knowledge of the, the anatomy, the physiology, his knowledge of the dysfunctions is so innate that it was like it's like we're going on this really cool adventure. The assessment took like half hour, right? Oh, he wow, did all yeah. sorts of cool stuff, but it was fascinating to see this because I mean, obviously, Cairo that their job is much more assessment than massage therapist, right? So that's his bread and butter is learning or doing proper assessment. It was so cool to participate in that process. And I mean, at the end of it, you know, we're both sitting there scratching our head. You know, he's like, I don't know what's going on. I'm like, I don't know either. Um, but interestingly enough, we figured out that. It was my ankle. This oh. like crippling hip pain I have is due to a really old, well, not really old, but like five, six year old ankle injury. And it was, it was so cool how he found this out. And, and I, I just, I got to share this because it was one of the coolest things that I've experienced. So he tests um, uh, resisted hip flexion and kind of like horizontal abduction ish, you know, checking out the hip flexors and the TFL and weak, super weak. Does some treatment, you know, like does some dry needling, does a little bit of active release, right? No, no adjustments, just does some, some massage essentially. Yeah. Retests, phenomenal strength. And here's the thing he did. He goes to the bottom of my foot and he takes his fist and he just goes, he does four light taps on my heel, retests my resisted range of motion, no strength at all. Oh, so it was due to my previous ankle injury because I yeah. took up running again after my ankle injury this summer. So what I found so fascinating is, is again, going into this assessment thing is, is what I, what I believe in and watching him follow a similar process. It's like, you got to learn the active, you got to learn the passive, you got to learn the resistive. What I really like about what you said, Chad, is you got to learn the why. Yeah. Why are you doing active? Why are you doing passive? Why are you doing resistive? Because when you really get the why, you can go on these adventures of assessment and kind of come to a non-textbook conclusion for the majority of cases that don't fit the, the, the textbook criteria, right? It was a pretty cool experience. But anyways, yeah. I digress. That was a long tangent that I didn't mean to go on, but I thought it was a cool story nevertheless. Oh, that was good. <laughs> that was a cool story, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, the tap on the heel and that kind of like reset things. Um, yeah. That's interesting. And, and I totally agree. Like as a, as a student, you follow the steps. And then as a practitioner, as you get experience, um, I think with knowledge and experience comes wisdom and mm -hmm. you can, you can essentially utilize that and be like, okay, I'm going to do resisted. And then I'm going to like maybe palpate and yeah. you don't know why you're doing that. You're like, oh, this is weak. I wonder if it's like hypertonic as well. And then you ask the patient, oh, what's that feel like? They're like, that's sore. And you're like, mm -hmm. okay, well, let's work on that. Let's, let's do some, some massage. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't have to be in the order, but when you're learning it, it's a lot easier Agreed. to learn when it's in an order. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, you got it. You got to learn it. It's just just like any type of other uh, activity, you know, like you, you got to learn the rote movements until the movements are so ingrained in your, your implicit memory that that's when you can go off script and really get creative. And and, and I'm curious, you know, like somebody who, who teaches assessment and, you know, as, a, as an athlete who, who does rehabilitative exercises and all these cool things that you do. Um, I do understand that you've you've worked in a variety of different environments, including a spa. You know, so how does that fit? How does it fit as as somebody who's who's quite therapeutic? From the sounds of it, I don't want to you know say that to you, but from the sounds of it, quite therapeutic in your approach, working yeah. in a spa. Yeah, great question, and I'll I'll be a little bit maybe semi vulnerable here, but um, when I was in school for massage. I'll be honest, that first year of massaging back in 2007, um, we're learning kind of basic effleurage, petrissage, palpation, um, just the relaxation techniques. And I'll be honest, I was a little bit bored. Um, mm -hmm. 
because because I was like, I want to fix things. And because my my background personally was only therapeutic massage, like going to RMTs for a back injury, Achilles tendonitis, um, other slight like knee pains. I was lucky in high school. I didn't have too many injuries, but there was soreness where I was like, OK, I got to fix this so that I can train more. So all of it was sports massage. So that was the route that I wanted to go. And like second year massage was great. There was tons of assessment. There was tons of specific work. We learned a lot of muscle energy techniques. And then I got my like dream job and it was working at a, a personal trainer um, gym essentially with physiotherapists, other massage therapists. I think there was a Cairo there. Like, they may have came later, but I felt like this is where I want to be. And, and things were good, um, but other things led me to, to travel. I was young and I was like, I want to I leave Regina. I was like, I've been here long enough. I want to travel. So that's when I ended up at the Fairmont Hotel in Jasper. So mm, cool. that was literally the first time that I stepped into a spa. I was like, what mm -hmm. is a spa? And, oh, I should know what the letters stand for, but it's Latin for like healing water. I forget. It's S-P-A. I don't know if you know them. I didn't um, know that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So spa is, it's Latin for like healing waters. Um, you'll have to look it up in a second. Yeah. I'm going to do it right now as, yeah, you, as yeah. you continue I, I forget, story. I was teaching hydrotherapy a little while ago, so it's, it's dwindled away. But what uh, what I liked about the spa was it helped ingrain that other aspect of massage therapy that I think I was a little resistant to, which was like relaxing the mind through the body mm. and i was like i can't just treat their supraspinatus and their deltoid i need them to literally relax to breathe oh, yeah. to use some of that deep diaphragm breathing and there were treatments that i learned that were very spa specific like like wraps and long scalp massages and and like specific foot massages i learned a little bit of foot reflexology so that i could be better at massaging the foot too. Um, but I really saw the value and, and I was amazed at how good people felt. I often did full body massages and because of my athletic and therapeutic massage background, I think they liked that more because I took those skills and turned it into like a relaxation massage. So people would get up off the table. They're like, that was like the best massage. And and it's a little intimidating because you're working at the Fairmont and they're paying well over a hundred dollars. I think some places are like 200, 300 almost dollars now at some spas. And you're like, wow, how am I going to give a massage with that value? Mm. But people got up and they felt great and they felt rejuvenated. Yeah. So I found the value of the, the relaxation massage in that spa world. And, and in ways it was quite fun and relaxing, uh, especially working at the, and Jasper and living in mm -hmm. Staffacom. I did the same thing in Lake Louise. I honestly, I recommend any massage therapist to work on a resort, especially here in Alberta, I work on a mountain resort for at least a summer or a year, uh, mm. especially if they're young. Yeah. It's such a good time. Yeah. I really appreciate that. It's, it's been something I've been talking a lot more about as well um, and finding that transition in, in my own career, similar to yours, where it's, it's like relaxation is therapy and it's mm -hmm. a profound therapy in, in its own right. And in many different ways, like, of course, there's the, the whole systemic nervous system relaxation, which is deeply therapeutic. But even when somebody does come in with a specific problem, it, it, it's so challenging to address that problem long term without first regulating the nervous system without first getting the person into relaxation so i mean like not only is it profoundly pleasant to experience one of the things you get somebody to do to come back is make sure they feel good mm -hmm. yes it's got the relaxation which also is super important um but there's so much more to it like like people come to massage therapists largely because we can help people relax like and, and there's a lot of stats on that now too showing that the majority of people even those looking for therapeutic outcomes are booking a massage therapist because they want that combo they want yeah. to feel really good and hopefully fix the problem right so what a, what an amazing uh experience to to kind of have that baked into to your your way of practicing at such an early state in your career right well i shouldn't say early it was 
we'd already yeah. finished school and been practicing for a bit. But yeah, yeah. Well, it was kind of early. I was uh, I had only been practicing for just over a year, and hmm. and yeah, then I shifted over to the spa world, and and uh, it, it it took a while, not too long, a few months, but then I just like integrated it that in, into me the as the therapy and the massage, and I hmm. think in this you'd probably agree with the way society is going, the stress that people have, the anxiety, the depression, um, having that physical touch in a <sighs> relaxation kind of way is so beneficial. There are not many professions that can give that. I mean, even yeah. if you go to see a therapist, the therapist, like for a counseling and, and to see a psychologist, they're, they're not supposed to hug or touch, right? Oh. Um, so, and I believe human beings need touch, right? Oh, I'm sure you yeah. agree. Like, just like food, water, shelter, we need connection. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a pretty broken record when it comes to that exact discussion of the importance of of touch and and the the truly endemic levels of stress. Like, like what we know very again very conclusively is out of the top ten causes of death outside of trauma. Well, we don't necessarily, particularly if you go down the Western route, we don't have a common causative factor. But what we do have is a common aggravating factor. And we know universally stress makes literally everything worse. My opinion, it's also the root cause of most of the, the major chronic illnesses that people are experiencing. But it's like universal. And just yeah. like you said, I, I can't actually think of a modality that is more effective at helping with stress than massage. I really can't like a really good relaxation massage mm -hmm. when when i think of anything i could do in order to de-stress i like running no nope, yeah that wouldn't be it it'd be lying on a table and getting one of those like like soul shifting massages you know the ones right yeah that's like so it's so cool to think that massage therapists are in an amazing in fact the position to solve what i believe to be like the greatest tied for the greatest uh i guess health crisis that we're experiencing with which is our our catastrophic stress levels yeah yeah you made me think of a book i'm reading by do you know gabor mate oh man Dr. Gabor? Yes. Yeah. is yeah. it the myth of normal uh, i haven't started that one so i i, I heard about him a few years ago a friend of mine shared um a short little um youtube video about him i don't know if it was just on instagram mm -hmm. and uh I listened to it. It was good. And then I, I finally found a book and I was like, oh, I think I'm going to buy this one. And I couldn't believe how old it was. It's actually, I think, 23 years old. It came out in 2000 or 2001. So this uh -huh. is the one. Um, I think it was his first book. And oh, what is the name of it? It is um, When Your Body Says No. Well, that's my favorite of all of his books, for yeah. sure. Yeah. For and I'm, sure. I'm about three quarters of the way through it. Um, and I've just learned so much. Like he gets into essentially how our thoughts, our emotions and our stresses mm -hmm. get stored and then they manifest as diseases. And it's, 100%. it's a little controversial. And he says that too, but to, to say that things like um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis and dementia, it's, it's caused by emotions that are stuck. And, Agreed. and that's, that's tough to teach people, right? It's, it's hard to, it's hard to accept, but it, it does yeah. make sense in, in many ways. Um, yeah. And it really overlaps to my yoga e exploration, the, the knowledge from reading books by like Osho and my yoga teacher trainings, and even the, the Bhagavad Gita, um, we had to read that um, for one of my teacher trainings. So using using your body and your mind to let emotions flow and and expressing yourself helps to mm -hmm. manage stress and like yeah. you said you can do that with massage personally i like um i like massage but i also like uh, yoga i'm a big fan mm -hmm. of yin and restorative yoga um and we can talk more about yoga's differences and specifics later um, but I went for a float actually for the first time in five years. I'd, I'd worked at a float center, so I used to float for free back in Canmore. Um, but I just finished up a cleanse this last week, and I was like, "Oh, I'm going to finish with a nice float." And I found that really relaxing. So just mm -hmm. letting the the salt water just lift your muscles and relax. It was like a one hour shavasana 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and those are my ways. So my go-to yoga pose is legs up the wall, calms the nervous mm-hmm. system, um, decreases your blood pressure. Uh, that one's really good. And then, of course, um, I'll foam roll. I'll go get a massage. And then the, <laughs> the yin and restorative yoga I really enjoy, too. And acupuncture, I dig actually. It. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I dig it. Any, anything. Anything we can do to yeah. uh, to to sort of manage the stress levels. And, yeah. you know, talk, talking about uh, Gabor Mate, I'm, I'm happy you brought that up because that really is probably one of the most influential books that I've ever read. It fundamentally shifted my my practice modality. So in the TCM world, uh, the traditional Chinese medicine world, we we have to learn pathology just like everybody else does. But our, our study of pathology is very different than it is in Western medicine. Yeah, it's weird. We have, uh, really? It's weird. It's yeah, just it's like weird. weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but at one point in time when I was teaching a class on, on diagnosis in Chinese medicine, it was an advanced diagnosis class. I went through all the classics and all the textbooks and I listed out according to traditional Chinese medicine in order of prevalence, meaning how often they are the primary cause of disease, the causes of disease. Number one was emotions in Chinese medicine, like the number one cause of disease is emotions. After that, it's going to be diet. After that, it's a sedentary lifestyle. And then we move down the list, right? But fascinating that it's emotions. And then listening to Gabor Mate as well, I I agree that it is controversial, but I've gotten to the point where it's not. Like in my, yeah. my own personal experience, as well as dealing with my patients and clients, it's not at all. And I'm really grateful that you brought up all the other ways that a person can can work through this. Because let's be honest, getting a massage every single week or as often as we feel stressed, it's not realistic. But there's mm-hmm. so many other things that we can do. And I think one of the reasons why I too love yoga so much is how accessible it is and how powerful and profound it is. Like you could mm-hmm. just roll a mat out on your living room floor and yeah. do your do your restorative, you know, throw, throw a YouTube class on, which there's plenty of amazing ones. Totally. Yeah. If if you're open to it, I'd like to explore a little bit about your your perspective and your way of practicing and, and what got you into the yoga realm as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so the yoga, so I, I told you how I kind of ended up in Jasper. Um, so I worked in, in Jasper, uh, Jasper, Alberta, for those international listeners, is a mountain town for people who don't know, which is beautiful. Probably still one of my favorite mountain towns. Everybody knows Banff and Lake Louise. But Jasper's like a, a best kept secret. It's like mm-hmm. Banff and Lake Louise, but is it's bigger and it's it's more grounding, it's more calm, and it's more wild. Um, so I, I loved it there. Beautiful lakes as well. Um, after Jasper, I moved to Lake Louise and worked at the Fairmont there. And I was going through some personal emotional things, and that's when I started to head a little deeper into the the spiritual side of things. I was like, okay, I understand the body. I know what the brain is, but I want to go and learn a bit more about the mind. Um, um, and I found that this, a couple books, so Eckhart Tolle's books, I found um, his books. I had them, but I didn't read them. And then I finally read them and I read both of them. So The Power of Now and then A New Earth. And then I read a book on Buddhism. And then I felt like quite grounded and. I found this other book called Shantaram, which is just a story. So it's a biography, essentially. And it's so big, like 900 pages, really thick book. Intimidating for a guy like me who doesn't like to read too much. Um, But during that same time in the summer uh, in Lake Louise, there was a yoga teacher who would teach at the rec center. And I started going to his yoga classes. I think a friend was like, uh, hey, you want to go to the yoga? And I went with them, a group of us, and they they never went back. They they left, and then I went back. And then I started to do almost one-on-one because this was um, rec center yoga for Lake Louise citizens. So it was only $5, but the hmm. government helped to subsidize it. So there were always going to be a class for that teacher. He would drive in from Canmore. So I'm reading this book called Shantaram that takes place in India, this whole story. And then I'm going to yoga and I'd gone through this stressful personal stuff in life. And I was finding that the yoga was starting to like open me up. It was starting to help me process my thoughts and my emotions. And I was sitting there in like a, a deep stretch, like a yin stretch for my pecs. And just feeling these sensations in my arm and breathing into my body. I was like, 
there's a lot going on right now and I'm not even like doing anything. Um, so combining the yoga in Lake Louise um, with that book, I just was like, you know what? I'm going to go to India and study yoga. So mm. I just kind of clicked that in my brain. And, and then I did. I did about a year later. Yeah, it was a year and a half after that. Uh, I went to India. I, I chose a school and I studied Ashtanga yoga. Uh, I practiced. I wouldn't call it a full Ayurvedic kind of lifestyle, but I was um, doing eight to 10 hours of yoga a day with meditation, pranayama, eating like I cut out coffee, cut out alcohol, cut out meat as well. Um, so vegetarian. And I did drink lots of chai. Chai is obviously really good in India. Um, and then, yeah, just did my Ashtanga yoga teacher training. And after that, I was like, okay, I'm ready to teach. And then I had to overcome a little bit more struggles, and that was the the intimidation to teach. Mm. So I got back to Canada, and then I started Toastmasters because I needed to overcome this fear of public speaking. I was like, I can't be a yoga teacher if I'm scared to teach in front of people. Um, so Toastmasters helped with that, and then I finally started teaching, and then I dove deeper into yoga therapy, uh, and then that's when I started doing a bit of one-on-one -on -one yoga therapy sessions. Uh, and then I moved to Calgary and then I started teaching regularly about one, one class a week and then a few mm. private sessions. Yeah. That was a long story explaining it all, but. No, I appreciate it. And, and I'm really actually quite curious about, about one aspect of it. So as you're describing your story, right? Um, the thing that got you into yoga from the sounds of it was some pretty, pretty hard times, right? Like whatever was going on in life was, was hard enough that there was probably some pretty big questions about all of the, the life stuff, philosophical, metaphysical, existential, right? From the mm -hmm. sounds of it got you into yoga. And then my experience of studying the, the yogic path, particularly for those who go to India is it's pretty powerfully philosophical and uh, the the understanding of yoga we have in the West as an exercise class is not at all what yoga is. Yoga is the, the, the physical aspect of yoga is only one relatively small branch of what mm. yoga actually yeah. is, right? Yeah, so they so call I might it, be oh. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um Please. what you're what you're describing is the so there's the eight limbs of yoga. And mm -hmm. I can't remember every single one off by heart, but there's um like pranayama and there's meditation, and then there's asana, and then there's mm -hmm. like daily practice. I think kriyas might be involved too. I can't remember the exact list, but in the West here, we, we do one of the eight limbs. Yeah. You mm -hmm. might do a second where you do a little pranayama, but you're totally right. And so when I say I was studying yoga for eight hours a day, we did an hour every morning of, of breathing. So just sitting mm -hmm. and doing usually six, six or seven different breathing techniques. And that yeah. could have been breathing in through one nostril and out the other one or retention. And mm -hmm. then we did meditation. Um, and then we did a lot of philosophy. So learning about those eight limbs. So yeah. I wasn't just doing yoga practice all the time. No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't assume yeah. so in that more traditional route. What I'm curious at, what I'm getting at with this is I may be projecting and forgive me if I am, but my intuition is telling me that I, I I don't think a person can go into that experience and do what you did and come out the other side the same person. Yeah, sure, you might be a little bit more bendy and flexible, but I'd imagine the internal alchemy, the, the, the internal transformation that occurred through that process of studying yoga and teaching yoga, I'm sure was profound. So the question I have after all of this is, how did that, how did studying yoga in, in all of its eight limb aspects going through that pretty strong internal world and challenges. How did that affect your massage practice? Ooh, good question. I would say uh, a couple ways. So obviously it affected me and my life and, and even how I live, um, sort of changing what I value, um, following some of those. I would say my philosophy is like a mixture between things I've learned about the eight limbs mixed with like a little bit of Buddhism and some spirituality and even some stoicism as well. I'm a big fan of, of stoicism um, and Greek mythology too, and even the Hindu myths. 
Um, so I've applied that more to my life and the, the massage and link with yoga. Uh, I've done a couple things with that, where I actually teach one-on-one -on -one yoga sessions and do massage, not technically when they're in a yoga pose, but if I locate areas of tension, um, I massage it. So I have them lay down on the yoga mat and I, I work on the muscles. And then I have them go back into the yoga pose to feel those, those differences. Mm. So because I do both, um, I can, I can integrate those two. And I used to call it yoga integration. So, uh, that's what I did a little bit more in Canmore and I do it a little bit here in Calgary and I'm mm -hmm. trying to do a little bit more of it as well. Um, so that's one way. And then when it comes to the massage, I use a lot of breath awareness. I look at the whole body a little bit more. I combine the mind um, and then I like to prescribe or, or recommend, I should say, yoga poses for stretches. So it's easy for someone to be told like, oh, do this stretch. But it's like, hey, do this stretch, but in this way and take five or 10 deep breaths to relax. Mm -hmm. Like I said, legs up the wall is my go to pose. So I, I tell everyone, yeah, do that. Put your phone away, set a timer for eight minutes and just breathe mm -hmm. start to let things go so breathing in through the nose and then out through the mouth that helps to calm the nervous system and let go of emotions in a in a quicker more um specific and better way than just breathing in through the nose and out through the nose so out right. through the mouth with a sigh oh, we can just kind of let things go easier mm -hmm. so i'll utilize that in my practice Hmm. Another thing I'm quite curious about, and this this uh, sparked my, my interest when you talked about you just kind of finishing up a cleanse where you did your float is um, one thing I've I've discovered through these interviews that I do within the podcast as well as just being in the the wellness industry, and I I have very few friends. Like my social circle is pretty much entirely made up of other wellness practitioners. It's just how it goes. So one thing I've definitely discovered is um, few of us practice what we preach. Few of mm. us. Some do, some don't. But I'm curious, um, what what do you practice in order to maintain your own state of well-being? And to be totally honest, if it's nothing, I think that's as good of an answer as anything because then everybody else who does nothing is like, okay, it's not just me. So no shame no matter what the answer is. But I'm curious what, what you do do for your own your own daily practice. Uh, I would say the, the biggest parts that I try to integrate into my life are meditation. And then I would say that I follow a lot of Ayurvedic principles. So Ayurveda is actually something I'm looking to study a little bit more down the road. Um, and if you're curious what Ayurveda is, it's, uh, it's Sanskrit for the science of life. So I really like that, that description. So it's like, how does life work? How does nature work? And it's applying the laws of, of life, nature, using that as a science into your own well-being. And it's actually really similar in some ways to traditional Chinese medicine. Um, so Ayurveda comes from India, TCM from China. Um, there's a lot of ancient links between those two. Um, we follow the, the element theory of um, earth, fire, water, space, and air, whereas I'm missing, I think, um, wood is what TCF mm -hmm. has. So there's no wood involved there. Um, so with that, and I won't go into too many details, but you can do these little Ayurvedic dosha quizzes. So to figure out what your body type is. Um, so a dosha is like your constitution. And in Western science, we used to call it the mesomorph, the ectomorph, and the endomorph. In India, they call it the pitta, the vata, and the kapha. So these are your body types. It's what you're born with. It's what's in your DNA and what you got from your parents. So I'm a pitta with a, a little bit of kapha. So I'm a mixture. I'm a mixture of fire and water. And I'm also a Pisces too. So you add more water in there. Um, but with that knowledge, you can now apply those principles to your daily life, to your daily habits. So I'll choose foods that are a little less fiery. For example, I don't mm. eat too many spicy foods. I try to limit alcohol and caffeine because that'll like rev up my nervous system 
which is already quite fiery. So I apply those principles. And then I use things like yoga to kind of moderate my nervous system. Uh, I try to check in and I go and um, I'll, I do a lot of foam rolling or I'll go to the gym. I really like the gym. The Pitta body type thrives pretty well in the gym. Um, and uh, I, I work out, I lift weights, work on the muscle system essentially, and that calms me down. Um, mm -hmm. So the big things are just living with those principles. And I'm definitely not perfect. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like my coffee. Um, I I meditate every morning with a latte. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I combine the two, but I, it helps me enjoy it. It helps me slow down. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I try to limit it to just one coffee a day instead of more. Um, and then I apply those other Ayurvedic principles. And if you're curious to learn more, I mean, people can message me. They can follow me on Instagram, email me, text me. Mm -hmm. um, happy to share more information about that. That's super yeah. cool. No, I, I yeah. appreciate a, a lot of what you said. And two, two things that stood out for me is one, meditating with your latte. Thank you. Thank you very much for saying that. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do morning cacao ceremonies. So that's my big meditation every morning with, with ceremonial cacao, right? And, and it's fundamentally shifted my meditation. And some mornings, I won't have a cacao. Some mornings I'll have a, a coffee. But what I, what I really appreciate about what you said is so many people have this idea that meditation means just sit there and do nothing, which it can be, right? Of course, mm -hmm. there are many different types of meditation. But meditating on something you enjoy, like a latte, what mm -hmm. a great motivation to sit down and do your meditation, mm -hmm. to just sit down and, and enjoy the thing you enjoy. Beautiful, beautiful way. Yes. So I'm very grateful yeah. that you brought that up. Yeah. 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 And it was, it took a while to get there too. Cause initially when I got back from India, I was like, oh, I need to meditate with nothing, silence, breathe, really relax. And then um, eventually I was like, wait, this is kind of silly. Like, this is hard. This is not that fun. Um, and I was talking to my girlfriend earlier this morning about meditation and she was saying like what the West thinks meditation is, is very different from what the East thinks meditation is. And you don't even have to call it meditation. It's just kind of being with your body. Um, and that's mm -hmm. all I really do. Often I'll use a 10 minute YouTube guided meditation. Um, nice. There's a channel I follow and, and I like it because it switches things up and I'm like, Oh, she mentioned this. And I'm like, this kind of applies to life. And sometimes I'll just do silence or, or have um, some ocean sounds in the background mm -hmm. and I'll stretch and then I'll take a sip of coffee and then I'll yeah. breathe and then I'll stretch more. And after that 10 minutes is up, I start my day. I, I go to work. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. I love it. I love it. And the other thing that you're mentioning about, particularly with the kind of bringing in the Ayurvedic approach, what I liked about that when, when you said you start by understanding your dosha, right? Uh, and, and this is, you know, one of my, my big things and I'm talking about more and more and gradually shifting my entire company in this direction. It's like step one, know thyself, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so cool that that part of your own, the work that you do starts with figuring out what works best for your constitution. Figuring out way like uh, me in, in the TCM uh, world, I'm I'm very metal, very water. So for me, spicy food is really good because it softens me up. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you you take a sword and you put it in the flames. Heat kind of makes metal a little bit more malleable. So mm -hmm. knowing that about myself, knowing that 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 heat is good for me. But then somebody like yourself or for Brienne eating spicy food kind of sparks that fire and it gets things going too much, right? Yeah. So I really, really appreciate mm -hmm. that, that that is a starting point is just figure out your constitution. And then from there, you can realize like maybe the gym isn't the best place for you. For mm -hmm. me, going into the gym is like, it's like a death center. It's like, oh, I just, I do not want to be here. Yeah. Um, but putting me in, 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 you know, like a nice quiet room doing a yoga thing or something like that. So just knowing your constitution yeah. I really think is the best place to start when it comes to finding the perfect practice. Because all of these shoulds, man, they're killing us. They're yeah. killing us. Yeah. You should meditate like this and you should do yoga like that. And you should yeah. go running and you, uh, yeah. you know, some people, yeah, but for the majority, not so much. Yeah, yeah I completely mm -hmm. agree. And another thing just to add on to the Ayurveda and the dosha, um, it's it's so different for everyone. And this is one of the big reasons why I like it is because there's no one size fits all. So you could be a kapha body type and 
from what I recall, is the, the Kaffa are actually kind of the slow and steady wins the race kind of person. So they're they're often a little bit more calm and they're happy to be calm and, and do not very much. So the stagnation just is like part of their nature. Mm. But once they get going, those are the people who are like, maybe you're going for a hike and you're climbing a mountain and they're just like trudging along and they just go and go. And and they actually make from from what I read, like good long distance runners. And they often mm-hmm. think here in the Western world, where it's like, oh, you're you're too heavy to be doing um, running or something. And it's like, well, no, you actually utilize adipose tissue extremely well, which would mm-hmm. make you great for long distance events. And it doesn't totally. have to be running. It could be biking. And you can mm-hmm. see these different types in different athletics. Like, yeah. I, and I don't know them for sure, but like I would guess Michael Jordan in basketball, he's a bit more of a pitta, like strong, mm-hmm. quick. Then Shaquille O'Neal, he's a bit more of a kaffa because he, he is quite big, big bone, yeah. never was really lean. And then you got um, Pascal Siakam, who's more of a vata body type, um, mm. where he's he's like lanky, but still like quick and like reads the reads the plays really well. It's funny I'm using basketball because I don't even, I don't even watch basketball, but, <laughs> um, but I feel like most That's people funny. know those names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I think it also goes into this, this thing that I'm pretty passionate about, which is uh, play to your strengths, you know, like, mm-hmm. like if you're good at something, do it. And if you're not good at something, I mean, this might be kind of contrary to what a lot of people say, but don't do it. Like if, mm-hmm. if you're not good at it and you don't enjoy it, don't do it. Yeah. Like, the, yeah, there's something to be said about the, you know, it builds character and all of that. But let's be honest, we're, we're all adults here. If you've been suffering away doing something your whole life that you're not good at and you're doing it to build character, you probably got enough character. Yeah. Have you have your damn latte with your meditation in the morning. You don't need to sit cross-legged and blow out your knees because of something yeah. like that. It's like f- find your constitution, figure out what you're good at, what your strengths are, and embrace that, right? I think I think that's a a much better recipe for longevity than um than just doing doing what we're told. Now that's kind of one of my beefs with yoga. I love yoga, so I've got a beef with it though, and that's the tradition behind yoga. It's following a specific school of thought, and it's like, yeah. So yo- yoga postures were were originally designed for adolescent boys. Mm. You know, like not everybody's got a body build like an adolescent boy. So trying to make everybody do the same postures. Anyways, that, that's a big tangent that I'm going to immediately digress on. Um, but what I mean to say is. Do what you're good at. Do what your body likes. Do what your constitution likes. I think it's it's mm-hmm. great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious now, which is kind of a, a a tangent, or not a tangent, but a but a different direction here as we're kind of uh, approaching the, the time of our conversation. One of the things that I'm very curious about, and I'm I'm even more curious to hear from a fellow instructor because you have the opportunity to see a lot of massage therapists, and and I'm I'm, I'm my experience has been that within the first I don't know, two or three days of interacting with students, I got a pretty damn good idea who's going to be an amazing massage therapist and who's going to be so-so. Like it's, it's shocking how quick one can identify these. But what I'm curious from you is in your experience and in your opinion, what do you think really makes a very good and successful massage therapist? Oh, great question. Yeah, this is, um, it's like being a high school counselor in a way. <laughs> so giving <laughs> advice to up and coming RMPs. Um, well, the first thing is, is you got to understand that it's physical, right? We all know that. And so if you don't like doing physical labor at all, if you don't like, um, like gardening, or if you don't like building things or working with your hands, like it doesn't have to be hard labor, but if you don't like working with your body, that's not a great avenue to go, right? Mm. Um, if you prefer a job where you're sitting in front of a computer or like maybe discussing with people or like working in a lab, for example, if that if that sounds better for you, um, then being an RMT is probably not a good choice. So you've got to be able to think like, hey, do I want to work with my hands, right? Mm-hmm. As a kid, I was really into Lego building things. So it was just part of me right from from the start of my life right i still do a little bit of woodworking once in a while um fixing bikes taking things apart um i like to see how things work 
So you got to be able to work with your hands. Um, and then you, you've got to understand that the school is, we talked about this earlier. Um, there's a lot of physiology that you might think, Hey, what does this have to do with massage? Um, so you got to be open to that, open to learning things that you may not be ready to learn. And then you also want to be a caring person. So most people say like, I like helping others, pretty much everybody, like as a human being, we kind of lean towards helping others that I, I believe we, we got to where we are by cooperating, not being competitive. Yeah. Um, so as a species, we're cooperative helping people. Um, but you got to help them in a more deeper way where you're spending mm. like an hour on them, where you're, yeah. you're communicating with them a little bit. Um, you're focusing, you're using your body and you need to be able to kind of slow down your mind a little bit too, and just focus on another person, another body. Mm. I don't know if that answers your question too well, but perfectly. Yeah. It answers it perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And you know, as we, we kind of draw our chat to a close, is there, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Any, any thoughts that came up or any points that you think would be particularly helpful for the listeners? Um, I like to always reiterate the, the assessment thing. So uh, yeah. for the RMTs listening, like uh, learn to utilize your assessments in a, I mean, it doesn't have to take long. A lot of students are like, this takes a while. Why do I need to assess? Um, most of the time you won't have to do much of assessment, but in 30 seconds, you can get really solid information about what your patient needs. If you don't utilize that 30 seconds or, or a minute, it might take longer. And usually when it takes longer, um, it's necessary. And the, the patient is grateful because they're like, oh, this person wants to see what's wrong with me, right? Mm -hmm. they, they actually do care. But if there's nothing really that wrong, that 30 seconds is utilized to be like, okay, they're doing pretty good. We're just doing a relaxation massage, kind of take care of some stress, some neck tension. Um, so yeah, I like to end with saying like, yeah, utilize it. Do at least some passive and active range of motion. Then, then you can, and then you can see, hey, what's what needs work, right? Like nice. hip pain on the front of the leg could be caused by glute tension, but it could be the hamstrings, or it could be the lumbar spine or the opposite hip, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just had an RMT that I traded with last week. He had uh, right hip sciatic referral pain and i checked the range of motion of both hips and the left was like really restricted so i was like okay let's fix this like this is clearly restricted we, we you don't have any internal rotation here your piriformis is tight so we treated that and we treated his hamstring to like free up those fibers that are compressing on the nerve and that was restricted too so he had right hip pain but i treated his right hamstring and his left glute and it worked and he's like, oh, nice. it's better. I can bend forward without pain. Mm -hmm. um, had you had I not done that assessment, most RMTs would just go to the right glute, just work on that. Yeah. Yeah. So you can become a more successful practitioner um, by doing your assessments. And I can talk about some of the things I have coming up too, if, if that's okay. Yeah, please yeah. do. That would be my next question is, uh, what do you got coming up? How can people stay in touch with you and uh, see what you got going on? Yeah. Uh, so I've got a, I have an Instagram, but I don't use it much. I, I've got a few videos on there. Um, I'll be honest. I hate editing videos. It's like a bit intimidating, but I just tell myself, just put something out there. Um, I like to show little stretches, kind of teacher related things, um, little routines where you can do some yoga for your hips. So nice. everyone's got tight hips, pretty much everyone, at least somewhere. It might be their glutes, might be their hip flexors. So I've got things like that that you can look at. Uh, my plan is to actually shift a little more to YouTube. I think that's probably a better platform. Um, so you can you can find me on Instagram at Chad Friel RMT here in Calgary, and you can message me there, um, ask questions about stretching, yoga, Ayurveda. That's great. And then um, I've got a course coming up, which I was planning to do it in November, but we've changed the date to January. And that one is a yoga anatomy course. So it's a one day nice. course designed for registered massage therapists to learn how to utilize yoga inspired stretches to give to your patients for home care. So for example, Wonderful. if they have 
uh, lower back pain and you find that it's the erectors in the QL, instead of giving like a forward stretch, I give them like, hey, let's use child's pose and another stretch that's more of an isometric hold. So with my workbook, I utilize two to three stretches for the same muscle, but some of the stretches are more passive, some of them are more isometric, and the other ones are kind of a mix. Mm. So using things like triangle pose to open up the pecs, we often think like, oh, that's more of a leg stretch, no? It's like, well, no, but it's, it's good for shoulder rehab. So that's my course that's coming up. The nice. plan is to have that at the end of January. So you can great message me on, about that if you got questions and want to sign up. I'll make sure to put uh, your contact information in the show notes. So anybody who is interested, that sounds like a really cool course to take. So that's, uh, that's again, in January. It's a yoga anatomy course for massage therapists. Awesome stuff. And with that, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, you I really too. enjoyed our conversation. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Appreciate it. It was fun.